Today's Faith and Finance Live is actually not live, so our phone lines are not open. Are you worried about a recession? Some economists say there's still a 35% chance it could happen in 2024. Hi, I'm Rob West. People often ask, will we have a recession? The answer, of course, is yes. We'll always have another recession. The real questions are when and are you prepared for it? If you're not, now's the time to get started. I'll talk about that first today. Then we have some great questions lined up for you. But don't call in today because we're pre-recorded. This is Faith and Finance Live, biblical wisdom for your financial journey. So far, the GDP is still in positive territory, although not by much, and the unemployment rate remains relatively low. That's a blessing. But since more and more indicators suggest the economy is slowing, it's time you recession-proof your finances. How do you do that? Well, step one, check your credit score and get your credit reports. This will give you a base point and will allow you to accurately judge the effect of any late payments if you're forced to make any in the future. You can get a free credit report from each of the three bureaus, Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax at annualcreditreport.com. With those reports in hand, you'll be able to show creditors that you've made timely payments on your various accounts in the past. That could help you negotiate better terms if you find yourself temporarily out of work. Step two, familiarize yourself with the Mayday budget. It has only four categories. The first is food. You have to eat, but keep it simple and no eating out. The next Mayday budget category is housing. Make your mortgage or rent payment. Then comes utilities and finally transportation. So food, housing, utilities, and transportation come first in the Mayday budget. With anything left over, you can pay other bills. Step three is to look for other sources of help. Your unemployment benefits may run out, but other resources will probably be available. Check out nonprofit organizations and local government agencies that may have assistance programs. You can call 211 to learn more about services in your area or go online to 211.org. Uh, Step four, make a list of all your creditors and their contact information. Be ready to call them and explain in detail whatever financial situation you may be facing, and then pray you don't have to use it. But if you do, it's ready. If you can't pay a bill, call your creditor before it comes due. Run toward your creditors, not away from them. When you call and speak to a representative, have your latest pay stubs handy so you can show how your income has been reduced. Uh, Tell that person how much you have available to pay on the debt for the time being. Ask if you can temporarily stop payments or make partial ones. Let them know how long you expect to be in your current situation. You may not know for sure, but try to give a reasonable estimate of how long it will take for you to begin making full payments on time again. Make sure you get the person's name and keep a record of what you talked about and any agreement you may have reached. Also, ask to have a copy of the agreement sent to you in writing. Creditors will usually do this anyway, but ask for it just to be sure and hang on to that email or letter when it arrives. By the way, scam artists will use tough times like a recession to victimize folks who are already in dire financial circumstances. So don't respond to emails or give out information to anyone who calls you claiming to represent one of your creditors. Step five, get professional nonprofit help for managing credit card debt. Contact our friends at ChristianCreditCounselors.org if you're starting to fall behind in payments or expect you're about to. They have arrangements with many creditors to lower your interest rates. You'll make one payment that covers several creditors, making things much simpler. It's not debt consolidation, it's debt management, and that can help you pay off your creditors 80% faster. You can make arrangements to speak with a counselor at christiancreditcounselors.org. If you are laid off and lose your health insurance, check out Christian Healthcare Ministries. They offer a medical cost-sharing alternative to health insurance, almost always at a much lower cost. You can find out how they do it at chministries.org. Now, step six is to save as much as possible. It's four times like a recession that we always tell you to have three to six months living expenses in your emergency fund. There's no better way to recession-proof your finances, so start 
start saving today. And finally, step seven, pray. Pray that God will provide wisdom for managing your finances in difficult times. James 1.5 assures us, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. So those are your steps to recession-proof your finances, and we'll put links to all the resources I mentioned in today's show notes. Much more to come just around the corner. Stick around. It is always great to have you with us today on Faith and Finance Live. I'm Rob West. Our team is not here today, so let me just remind you not to call in, but I will also remind you that we have some great questions that we lined up in advance, so you're not going to want to miss today's broadcast. Uh, Before we head to the phones, though, a quick email. These come to us at askrob at faithfi.com. This comes from Ralston. He says, we're buying a new car. I have a 20% down payment with a credit score of 775. Where can I get the best rate to finance the balance of the cost. Well, congratulations, Ralston, on a great credit score. Uh, You can check uh, NerdWallet, Bankrate, LendingTree, any of those three would be a great place to begin as you look for the best rates on auto loans right now. They may come from lenders you don't recognize, maybe they're online banks or otherwise, but your credit score should qualify you for the very best rates and terms. We appreciate you writing to us. Uh, Let's dive in today. We're going to begin in Texas. Go ahead, Jean. How can I help? Hi, my question is regarding a 1031 real estate exchange. Okay. I'm selling two rental properties, one of which is a two family that I occupy as primary residence. I am purchasing a two family home where I will be relocating and also occupying as primary residence. Can you explain how the 1031 exchange will defer the 20% capital gains taxes? And more importantly, will I have to pay capital gains tax on the portion, thereby eliminating a percentage of that tax? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, So the unit you occupy qualifies for the exclusion, while the sale price allocated to the other unit can be used in a 1031 exchange. Now, if I understood you correctly, you're planning mm-hmm. to move to a similar situation mm-hmm. where yes. you're going to occupy one piece and not the other, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so you would have to work through this. My understanding is that you could do the same thing on the purchase, is that the portion of the purchase that's allocated toward the unit you will not occupy would fall under the 1031 exchange rules, whereas the portion that you buy on your own would not. But uh, that portion would be uh, subject to the exclusion, the primary residence exclusion anyway. So you'd basically take the portion that relates to uh, your primary residence on the sale, go ahead and push that forward into this new property, the portion that represents your new primary residence, and then 1031 exchange would apply uh, to that portion in the new unit that is uh, going to be for rental purposes. Now, of course, just at face value, a 1031 exchange is just a mechanism for selling the property and delaying not avoiding, but delaying the capital gains. And so you've got to make sure you follow the the rules around that, which there's a timing factor there. Now, it sounds like maybe you've already identified that property, so you'll likely be in good shape. But you have to identify that new property within 45 days, and that has to be in writing uh, to the seller. And then there's a 180-day clock for completing the entire transaction. But as long as you do that, Then on your portion, you get the uh, exclusion of up to $250,000 in gains if you're uh, filing taxes as a single person. And then on the portion that is related to the rental, as long as you follow the 45-day and the 180-day rule, you would essentially push forward uh, or delay the capital gains on that piece. Yes, I am under contract with the new purchase, so I'm all set with the timing on that. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate clarifying that. You're welcome, Gene. Uh, Just make sure you uh, are are communicating well with your CPA 
and uh, any intermediaries with regard to the 1031 exchange, just so you follow those rules very closely. And and so therefore, uh, you don't have any problem at tax time. But thanks for being on the program today. All the best to you and in this move you have upcoming. Uh, Let's go to Oklahoma. Conroy, you're next on the program, sir. Go ahead. I am calling on behalf of my brother. He has credit card debt, about $40,000 in credit card debt with a 30% interest rate. All right. And um, he makes about $900 a week, and his his payments, just minimum payments, is about $1,350 a month. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions on how he could um, pay this down? He's looked at uh, bankruptcy or national debt relief program, different yeah. things like that. Yeah. Is he able, and I realize this is a huge challenge just because given the high portion uh, proportion this payment is to his overall income, because, you know, even if he's taking that 900 a week and, you know, in the months where he gets an extra payment, if he's saving that to try to normalize that, he's got about 4000 a month coming in. And as you said, he's spending about 1350 of that uh, on his uh, credit cards. Is he able to make that happen and live within his means just by eliminating every other unnecessary expense? Or is he going underwater every month? He has been going underwater. He has not been able to do it in the last 20 years. <laughs> yeah. So, Okay. Do you think that it's possible? I mean, could he make a dramatic change? So let me ask a couple of questions. First is, is he married or single? He's married and he has four children. Okay. All right. And, um, yeah, I mean, so this is really challenging. I mean, the the way I would typically recommend you handle this is you get in a credit counseling program where the interest rates drop and now all of a sudden through one level monthly payment without taking on new loans to replace the debt or consolidate it, we're actually making meaningful progress toward the debt reduction. But that's going to be a minimum of 3%. So, you know, you said it was, uh, I think you said it was 40000 uh, so at three percent, I mean, possibly that payment comes down to twelve hundred a month, but you know that's obviously a real challenge. Now, if he can find a way to do that, if you know he and his wife are on board and they're literally saying, okay, for the next several years, we're just going to double down and and make this happen, either by eliminating every unnecessary expense, which is not going to be easy, but it can be done, or you know maybe he's out getting a second job or she's working if she's not already or he's getting additional hours you know on his current job i mean getting really creative that would be the best way to go to avoid bankruptcy because now he's actually making some meaningful progress and so i'd i would recommend he connect with our friends at christiancreditcounselors.org if he's unable or unwilling to do that then i think at you know at some point we're going to be uh, in a bankruptcy situation because he may be forced into that just because of the the judgments that would likely be coming down the road against him that could end up re- you know resulting in some garnishment and things like that when a court gets involved because eventually if he's going underwater every month the credit cards are he's going to reach the limits if he hasn't already and he's going to be cut off and then it, things are going to go into arrears if they're not already and then turned over to collection and then kind of the process rolls from there. And there's not only the financial toll, but the emotional toll that comes from that as he begins to get hounded by those collection uh, folks and, you know, the, some of their tactics are less than scrupulous. So, uh, you know, I would recommend he, you know, really has a heart to heart, he and his wife, and just say, you know, are we willing to double down and and really attack this. And if they are either through cutting spending, getting more income coming in uh, or both, you know, then I would head to ChristianCreditCounselors.org. Okay. Can they handle this on their own as far as being able to hold the creditors and cut interest rates just to make principal payments? No, they can't. I mean, in the sense that they would have to get behind and then try to go in and negotiate settlements. It's far easier to work through a credit counseling agency because these lower interest rates are already set if you're willing to work through a nonprofit credit counseling agency like Christian Credit Counselors. There's no negotiations involved and you don't have to get past due. Hey, thanks for your call, Conroy. We appreciate it. We'll be right back. You're listening to Faith and Finance Live. This program is pre recorded, so we're not available to answer your calls. But you can email us your questions at askrob at faithfi.com. 
Julie and I were looking at our FaithFi app last night and just remarking about how costs are up across the board, where we needed to make some course corrections in envelopes that are already down further than they should be. And uh, we can only do that when we meet and talk about our spending plan. If we have that data available to us, that's the benefit the FaithFi app gives to us, and it could to you as well. And so if you haven't downloaded the app, created your own spending plan, and uh, created a system to have visibility in to your spending so you can stay on plan and actually have something left over at the end of the month to fund your goals, uh, I'd recommend you check it out. Just go to faithfi.com, that's faithfi.com, and uh, click the app button, or go straight to your app store, Apple or Google Play. Just search for FaithFi, that's Faith FI, Faith and Finance, and uh, you can download it today. I'd love to know what you think when you check it out. Hey, before we head back to the phones, let's take a few more emails today. These come into us all the time at AskRob at FaithFi.com. That's AskRob at FaithFi.com. This one comes to us from CJ. He writes, we use three credit cards and pay them off every month, one for gas, one for groceries, and one for bills. Since we proved we could handle credit, they raised our spending limits. With so much identity theft, we're thinking of closing the accounts. Is there an amount of time? we should allow between closing each card. We don't want to mess up our excellent credit scores. Well, CJ, first of all, I appreciate that you've managed uh, this credit so wisely. Um, It wouldn't really hurt your credit to dramatically to close these accounts. I'd probably do one every six months. That's going to lessen any kind of minimal impact you would have. I will tell you, though, that if you're managing this wisely and you're getting rewards on these cards, uh, one way to handle uh, the potential for identity theft, if you wanted to continue to use them, uh, would be to freeze your credit at each of the three credit reporting bureaus, Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian. It's free of charge. You do have to do it individually at each of the three. You can do it online, but that would prevent thieves from opening accounts in your name without the PIN number. And when they can't provide the PIN number, they would be stopped in their track. So yes, you can close those accounts if you want to. And again, I do want every six months, but if you wanted to continue to use them, you continue to pay them off every month, and you like the rewards you're getting, either cash back or maybe travel rewards, then freezing your credit might uh, give you an alternate approach to protecting yourself from identity theft. Thanks for writing to us. And then from an anonymous writer, this is a concerned mom. She says, my son needs help with paying back credit cards and loans. Is there a free service to help? Thank you very much. And uh, yes, there is a service to help. My preferred way to pay off credit card debt in particular is through what's called debt management. Our friends at ChristianCreditCounselors.org can help him get the interest rates reduced uh, and pay this off 80% faster. Here's how. When you go into credit counseling or what's called debt management, each of the creditors have a pre-negotiated lower interest rate. Now, the accounts will be closed when they're put into the program, but through the combination of that lower interest rate combined with a level monthly payment, which simply means as the balance comes down, because more go- is going to principal, with that level payment, you're actually going to get a snowball effect in the process. The combination of those two things, the snowball effect through the lower payment and the reduced interest rate is going to allow you to pay this back up to 80% faster. The great thing is you're honoring God by paying the debt in full, and it's a great service for you to take advantage of. So if you want to contact them, you can reach out to our friends again at ChristianCreditCounselors.org. They're all believers. They've worked with hundreds and hundreds of our listeners. So again, it's Christian Credit Counselors. Counselors.org. And thanks for writing to us. All right, now let's head back to the phones. Uh, let's see, we're going to head to Oklahoma. Hi, Larry. How can I help, sir? I've done my state planning, and one of the questions that I had, I can't remember the regards to Social Security. I'm 70, my wife's 69. If I pass away first, do her Social Security benefits change? Yeah, so when you pass away, uh, she would then qualify as a surviving spouse. Uh, for survivor's benefits, and she would likely get 100% of your worker's benefit amount. 
Um, and so, there, I mean, there's a few exceptions to that, but, she, you know, the SSA, Social Security Administration, will pay the surviving spouse uh, a percentage of the deceased retirement benefits, and it's, it's normally going to be uh, 100%. Uh, now, have you reached full retirement age yet? Well, I don't know how to answer that question. I started taking Social Security prior to full retirement age, I think, because I started taking it about uh, 62 Okay. Yeah. Very good. So uh, she will likely get what you are receiving right now as her benefit as a survivor's uh, benefit. And so that that would be the way that would typically work, uh, you know, as you look at, um, you know, how you build your budget around that moving forward, um, you know, depending upon her age, um, it would be somewhere between 71% and 99%, uh, you know, for most folks. And, and that that means that she would continue to get her benefit also, as well as, in most cases, all of mine or at least a big portion of it. Uh, no, she would get one or the other. And so she would, in this case, you know, get the higher of the two. So that does mean a reduction if she loses hers, even if she gets the, the higher of the two, which would be mine. Yes, that is correct. All yeah. right. I was yeah. not aware of that. that. That needs some planning. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it, Rob. All right. You're very welcome. Uh, Let's head to uh, Georgia. Hi, Roland. How can I help? Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, I turned 65 in December, so I've decided to retire, and I have a 401k, and I really don't know what to do with it. All right. Very good. Let's talk about that for a second. So uh, you are retiring. How much do you have in that 401k, roughly? Uh, Roughly about 100000 I think. Okay. Very good. Um, so let's do this. I'm going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about the options that you have and uh, how you should look at this in light of the uh, other income sources that you'll have in retirement and whether or not this can continue to grow or we're going to think about converting it into an income stream. So Roland, you stay right there. Back with more questions after this on Faith and Finance. We'll be right back. You're listening to Faith and Finance Live, and you can find us online at faithfi.com. However, today we are not live, so if you hear that phone number, please don't call. But do stay with us. There's lots of good information ahead. Uh, before the break, we were talking to Roland in Georgia. He's 65 years old, heading into retirement. He's got a 401k with a bit more than $100,000 in it and just wondering what does he do with it. Uh, Roland, first question, what are you most looking forward to as you head to this next season of life? What do you think God has for you? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> and I'm open to anything he has to come my way. Okay. I've, uh, I've done some things with making rescue mission. I've done things with prison ministry. So whatever he door opens, whatever door he opens, I should say, I'm I'm willing to do it. Okay. Yeah. Great. I think you know it's always important to be thinking about what are we retiring to, and not what we're, are we retiring yeah. from, and really pray through that because you've got some incredible wisdom and experience that you can use in service to the Lord. And our calling doesn't have an expiration date, despite what the world would tell us about this kind of Amen modern idea of retirement. So that's great. Uh, second question, Roland, is have you done a retirement budget? You know, often folks will live on somewhere between seventy and eighty percent of their pre-retirement income because we're no longer saving for retirement and the kids are off the payroll and maybe you're out of debt and, you know, things like that. Have you worked up your retirement budget yet? Well, the one thing I did do was I added up all my bills. I added up what I was getting from Social Security and I still have enough money left over. Okay. That's that's great. I've gotten yeah, well, I like that. So if you can live on Social Security alone, you know, that was only intended to cover about 40% of your pre-retirement income. So you're doing all right. That tells me you're living modestly and, uh, you know, you uh, have developed some some good uh, financial disciplines along the way. So that also tells me, Roland, then this 100000 you plan to just let this continue to grow. You're not thinking about taking anything out of it, right? Well, I might want to take a little bit out, but see, <laughs> okay. that's another thing. I'm not sure how much I want to take out, how much I yeah. put back, you know, what to do with it. 
Yeah. Well, you wouldn't be able to put it back. So once it comes out, you uh, are, you know, we'll have to add that to your taxable income. And that's permanently been removed from the, the 401k. I mean, you've got 60 days essentially to put it back, but for all intents and purposes, anything you take out of it, you've removed from that tax deferred environment. So I would challenge you to think about whether you can just not touch this money. Let's just let it grow. And that way you've got something if you needed to fall back on it for, you know, long-term care expenses or something unforeseen down the road in this season of life. In terms of what to do with it, uh, I would recommend you think about rolling it to an IRA. But before you do that, unless you want to manage this yourself and pick the investments, whether those are super conservative like bank products like CDs all the way to stocks and bonds and gold, um, unless you want to do that yourself, I'd probably start interviewing advisors and find someone who could ultimately manage this for you. The reason you'd want to do that first is whoever you selected would tell you who they work with in terms of what's called a custodian. They might work with Fidelity or they might work with Charles Schwab or they might be at Merrill Lynch or you know LPL. I mean, they could be at any number of firms. And once they told you where they work, they would open an, an IRA in your name, and then you'd roll that 401k out from your current 401k plan administrator to your new IRA under the oversight of the advisor. That's not a taxable event. It stays in a pre-tax environment. And then your advisor could deploy the investment strategy that you and he or she have agreed on. And then we're kind of off to the races at that point. But give me your thoughts on that. Yes, that was one of my another question I had. Do y'all have any uh, counselors in this area, or do you know of any good Christian counselors in the Georgia area? Uh, you've come to the right place, Roland. So yeah, we recognize and recommend the Certified Kingdom Advisor designation. So you might be familiar with CPA, Certified Public Accountant, or CFP, Certified Financial Planner. Well, the only industry-recognized and accepted designation around biblically wise financial advice is CKA, Certified Kingdom Advisor. And these men and women, now 1,500 of them in the U.S., Canada, have met high standards in character and competence and experience, and they've had a regulatory review and a pastor reference and a client reference, and they've been trained and demonstrated proficiency in applying biblical wisdom to their advice and counsel. Uh, so what I would do is go to our website, which is faithfi.com. That's faith fi.com. And then right there at the top of the page, Roland, it'll say, find a professional, find a professional. And you can put in the type of professional you're looking for. In your case would be investments. And then you could put in your zip code and you'll see a list of certified kingdom advisors in your area. Well, thank you so much. That's exactly what I want. Well, very good. Thank you, Roland, for calling, and may the Lord bless you, sir. All the best in this next you season too. of life. Hey, by the way, stay on the line, because I want to send you a gift. Uh, I, I want to send you a book from my friend Jeff Hainan. It's called An Uncommon Guide to Retirement, Finding God's Purpose for Your Next Season of Life. I think it'll be a blessing to you, and I'm going to send it to you as my gift for being on the program today, okay? Thank you, sir. I sure appreciate it. You're welcome. Stay on the line. We'll get your information. Uh, let's go to uh, South Carolina. Hi, Ellen. Go right ahead. Hi. I wanted to ask what you think about these um, their annuities where we went to a dinner and they presented this annuity and it's supposed to be a, um, guaranteed the value won't go down. Like we have 401ks and IRA is worth about maybe four hundred to four hundred fifty thousand. Okay. And anyway, we yeah. we were just wondering. Um, you know, they have different um, inf guidelines, information about it. You have to commit to ten sure. to twenty years. Yeah. What is your What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's a great question, Ellen. You know, it's interesting to me that annuities are often sold and not bought. <laughs> and here's what I mean by that. People don't tend to go out looking for annuities. They're typically sold annuities, and they typically involve a steak dinner. It's just kind of interesting that that's the way it happens. Um, are they my favorite investment option for somebody in your season of life? No, they're not. 
Uh, do they have a place? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so let's talk about that. So I understand you're 68 years old. You all are married. Uh, it sounds like you're retired. You've built up this nest egg of 400 to 450,000. So you've got a choice. You can either, in my view, hire an advisor to manage this money, like I just talked about with Roland on the previous call. And you would uh, have that advisor build an investment strategy that makes sense based on your needs, goals, and objectives. Do you need income from this? Is it just continuing to grow? How conservative do you want to be? And typically in this season of life, you might have a portfolio that ends up having 30% in stocks, maybe 60% in bonds, like corporate bonds, really high quality and, and government treasuries and, and notes, and then maybe five to 10% in gold, something like that. And it's, so it's very conservative and it, it, the goal is for it to grow at four or 5% a year, maybe a little bit more. And then you could pull income if you want. If not, you just leave it there and let it grow and you can offset inflation. But one of the ben, big benefits is if you need to access the money for any reason, long-term care, a major expense, you can access it. The alternative to that is this annuity that you described that uh, they talked about at your steak dinner. Uh, so let me do this. I've got to take a break. When we come back, I'll talk about why someone might consider an annuity as an alternative, and then we'll see where you guys need to go from here. We'll be right back. Stay with us. This is Faith and Finance Live with Rob West. Hey, if you hear a phone number mentioned today, please ignore that number and don't call us because today's broadcast was previously recorded. But we think the upcoming information will help you and make you a wise steward of what God's given you. So please stay tuned. Let's head right back to the phones here in our final segment today. To Texas we go. Hi, Christine. How can I help? Hi, um, I am an Uber driver, and I just want to say I listen to you all the time, and I love it, and my Uber passengers love it, too. So oh, I just awesome. had a question about my tax return. Yeah. Yes, I love it. Um, my um, husband and I did our taxes, and we went to irs.gov, and it asked us whether we're self. I was self-employed or whether I was an employee for Uber. And I wasn't sure, because I know they said I was an independent contractor, Right. So I'm not sure if I'm an employee of Uber or if I'm a self-employed and if yes. I could write things off like my car payments or my maintenance for my car or gas or anything like that. Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, you are an independent contractor, which means you're self-employed. You're not an employee and therefore you will not receive a W-2. You're typically with Uber going to receive what's called a 1099 NEC, which just stands, stands for non-employment compensation. Um, and then you can absolutely write off expenses against it. So there's two ways for an Uber driver to deduct the business use of your vehicle that the IRS will allow you to use. One is called the actual expense method, and the other is the standard mileage rate. So the standard mileage rate just says you, as long as you calculate the miles and you've got a you know a log or a documentation on this, you know if you calculate the miles that you drove for Uber, then you can take the standard mileage, which for instance uh, in 2024 is 67 cents a mile, and then that would be it. You can't deduct anything else. If you take the actual expense method, then you have to have records for it for your business expenses, but that would include, not limited to, but it includes your fuel costs, your car repairs, vehicle depreciation, auto insurance, things like that. Now, if you use your automobile for both personal and business, you've got to factor that in. So you would have to determine what it actually costs to operate the car for the portion of the overall use of that car that's business related. So you'd take those things that I mentioned, gas, oil, repairs, tires, insurance, depreciation or lease payments, and you would only attribute the portion of all of those things to the portion of the total miles driven that are business miles versus the amount of miles you drove in total, which would allow you to determine how much of it was for personal use. And then you could deduct it that way. So you, along with your CPA, could determine you know whether it makes more sense to do the standard mileage rate or the actual expenses. But in either case, you really need a good log for all of this so you can document it to the IRS if you're ever challenged. 
Yeah, the Uber app helps us out a lot with that. So Great. In, in other words, I'm hiring Uber to, like, I'm not an employee, so I'm hiring them to do that part, the third-party well, part. Well, they're hiring or, you as an independent contractor, and then they, as long as you, they, uh, you earn more than $600 in income for them for the year, then they're going to be required to send you that 1099 NEC. You've got to report it regardless of whether they give you a 1099, but they'll automatically send you the 1099 over $600. And so they've hired you as an independent contractor, which has a legal definition to it. You, you know, you're able to work at will and you set your own hours and, you know, I mean, you're running your own business basically, as opposed to an employee where, you know, you're getting a W-2 and you work set hours and you have a very specific job description, that type of thing. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes perfect sense. Thank you so much. And right. um, I'll continue listening. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Yeah, you're welcome, Christine. Thanks for your call today. We appreciate it. Uh, let's go to Arkansas. Brad, you're next up. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, hey, I, I was. Uh, I caught a little bit of a discussion you had, I think it was last week, on uh, reverse mortgage. Um, my wife and I, we're 63. We owe 32000 on a house that's worth... Uh, like ninety five a hundred thousand something like that, and uh, we're just wondering uh, a little bit more information about how that works yeah uh, so it it's a a wonderful planning tool to consider in this season of life it's not an automatic for everybody, but it's i think an often overlooked tool brad uh you would certainly would qualify i mean at at face value you need to be at least sixty two years old you are you need to have at least fifty percent equity in the home you do. Uh, So that's good. Basically, the way it works is it's also called a home equity conversion mortgage. The difference between the reverse mortgage and the conventional is the reverse mortgage doesn't um, require you to put up any personal guarantees. Uh, So normally with a conventional mortgage, uh, you are, you know, there's recourse, meaning if the home is sold, that's serving as the collateral for the loan. And for whatever reason, the home is not enough to satisfy the value of the loan, they have recourse against you personally. With a reverse mortgage, it's non-recourse. The government's guaranteeing anything that's owed beyond the value of the home. So what would happen is they'd take your age uh, and then the equity that you have, and you could do a couple of things. Number one is you could just stop making payments. So basically they would pay off the existing 32000 that you owe, and you wouldn't take any more of the equity out. And that balance would grow because there'd be an interest rate and some fees in the background accumulating. And then when you move or sell or you pass away, uh, the sale of the home would satisfy the mortgage. But the benefit is to you, you're no longer making payments. Uh, so it helps you in this season of life balance the budget because, you know, one of your expenses is now eliminated. The other approach is uh, they could give you a line of credit where it's not being paid to you, but you could tap into it if you need it. And then the third option is they take the uh, amount of equity um, and your age, and then they just give you an income stream for the rest of your life uh, at a certain level, and they would tell you what that was. And then, again, at you know, at your passing, your estate, let's say your heirs get the home, whatever that reverse mortgage balance is, the home is sold, it's paid off, and then the rest is available. So there's multiple options there, but it, it certainly is a tool that can be helpful depending on your situation. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, we're uh, we're struggling with some uh, credit card debt, so um, losing the uh, payment would sure help with us paying off the credit cards. Yeah, yeah, very good. So if you head to uh, our friends at Movement Mortgage, are just wonderful experts in this area and uh, do a great job. And and so if you head to movement dot com slash faith. That's movement.com slash faith. Uh, they can kind of run you through the scenario based on your actual situation, and I think it'll give you more details. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Brad. We appreciate your call. Richard in New York, I understand you have a similar question. Go ahead, sir. Yes. I was listening to your program last week, I think it was Monday or Tuesday night. Yes, sir. And a lady called in with a question about some stuff, and you said that a reverse mortgage would probably be, be okay for her. So I just need I just need from you today a a, a name of the of the company and a phone number. 
Yeah, very good. Uh, my team can give you that phone number offline, but basically it's Movement Mortgage is is who we were talking to, Harlan Acola, who uh, wrote the book literally on reverse mortgages and has been doing it for decades, was our guest. He joins us periodically on the broadcast and really is our, our kind of go-to expert there. Um, if you use the internet, movement.com slash faith, if you prefer a phone number, um, our team can give you that uh, offline, okay? Okay. Very good. So let's do this. You hold the line, and uh, we'll get that uh, phone number to you. And we appreciate your call today, sir. May the Lord bless you. Well, folks, uh, we covered a lot of ground today. I'll tell you, you know, as we think about managing God's money, uh, here's the reality. First of all, this is a really high calling. You know, you and I have been called to be stewards of the King of Kings resources. The goal, faithfulness over a long period of time. It's the daily decisions that allow us to uh, counteract the messages of this world and focus on the eternal, not the temporal. It means looking to God and his wisdom to be able to handle his money as a tool. Now, that means that we can enjoy it. That's clear in 1 Timothy. It means we can use it to provide for ourselves and our family. That's clear in God's word. It also means that we should use it to be generous, to be able to bless those on our path, those in need, even those ministries doing work in the name of Jesus to the ends of the earth. That's our goal because one day we will give an account. I mean, we know that to be clear from God's word. So we want to be faithful in managing God's money. Once we surrender our lives to Jesus, and that's our heart's desire here, is that that would be first, that you would understand uh, that you are a sinner, I am a sinner, and we need a Savior to pay the penalty for our sins. God reconciled that problem through Jesus, his son, who was fully man and fully God, who came to pay the penalty for our sins. And when we place our trust in him, it reconciles our relationship to the Father. It's called substitutionary atonement. It covers the penalty of sin and death through Christ's death and resurrection on the cross. Once we surrender our lives to him, then it's about stewardship of our time and our talents and our relationships and God's word and, yes, God's money. So, each day here on this broadcast, we want to encourage you in that role that you have and point you back to God's Word, allow you to celebrate with those who are having some victories along the way, allow you to hear from others who are struggling so you can be praying for them. And as we do that together as the body of Christ, I think it provides really just the encouragement we all need, because there's plenty of days where I'm discouraged and frustrated, even a little concerned or fearful at times, and we've got to replace that with faith and trust in God. And that's what we want to do as we gather together on this program each day. Hey, I appreciate you listening. I appreciate you calling. And we always love to hear from you as well. If you didn't get through today and you have a question, you're welcome to send that to us by email. Just send it to us at askrob at faithfi.com. Let me also mention quickly, Faith and Finance is listener supported. So if you found some value in this program, maybe you listen regularly as you're out and about in your car or at home or at work, and you want to make a gift of any amount, either one time or as a monthly financial partner, we'd welcome that. Just go to faithfi.com and click give, faithfi.com and click give. Hey, Faith and Finance Live is a ministry of Faith Fi and Moody Radio. Thanks to my team today, and we'll see you tomorrow. Come back and join us then. Bye-bye.